On April 20, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon disaster changed the lives of millions living near the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the scientists who responded to the crisis. These are some of their stories, intimate portraits of research, innovation, discovery. Welcome, I'm Jim McNamee, editor of Dispatches from the Gulf, a series of documentaries, short videos, and podcasts. This week is part two of a four-part series. We're turning the clock back to January 2016. The Gulf of Mexico can be dangerous in the winter, with unexpected storms and unpredictable currents changing every day. However, a group of scientists from around the world thought this was the perfect time to conduct one of the largest surveys of ocean currents ever done. Eric DeSaro was the chief scientist. The purpose of this entire project is to look at how oil might spread in a future oil spill. Knowing where it goes is a big deal, because if you don't know where the oil is going to go, then it's hard to prepare people and set up the cleanup, things like that. It's not an easy problem, which is why we're worrying about it. There's big currents in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. There's water coming up from the Caribbean up through the Yucatan, and it goes out through Florida Straits and past Miami here. But in between, it does all sorts of loops and things. And then that's a lot of what we're looking at, how those things propagate all the way up into the northern Gulf. We'll sort that out and try to figure out how those sort of predictive models that are used for oil spur prediction uh, might be made better. That's what we're trying to do. We're looking at fundamental physics. Although we're looking at a particular place, we're very much thinking about this from an overall position. How would you make the physics in the models that are used predict this better? So that's applicable in a great many places other than this. There's an old saying that that knowledge is power, and what that means in this context is that knowledge of how the ocean currents move, how they respond to wind, how they respond to other sort of things, topography, bottom of the ocean, that gives you the ability to predict better. That's a knowledge equal power thing, because it gives you the power to predict once you have that knowledge, and we're trying to develop that knowledge. When the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred, it was difficult to know where the oil might end up. One reason is that a study of this magnitude had never been done. However, due to advances in both GPS and manufacturing technology, studying the upper ocean currents is now more feasible. Some members of the team worked for over two years preparing for this experiment, with much of that time spent developing specialized equipment to use for their research. What really excites me, besides the science that we want to do, is we have an amazing set of tools that we haven't had before. We have a thousand drifters, a thousand things that we're going to throw in the water, and that's an unprecedented number. Helga Huntley, an assistant professor in physical ocean science and engineering from the University of Delaware, explains how drifter research has evolved. Drifters have been around for a long time. People have been losing things over the side of the ship forever and then found them elsewhere. But the GPS track drifters haven't been around for that long and they have been very expensive for a very long time. And so when I got into this field, decade or so ago, you know, we were really excited because we got 30 drifters deployed in one experiment. And this project has blown those proportions out of the water by having a thousand drifters. The drifters were developed at the University of Miami. Cedric Geigen is part of the team that created the final product. It took us two years to develop the drifters. Uh, we went through multiple design. It took us a lot of time in a wave tank at the University of Miami to test the drifter and make sure the, the design was not only working for us, but once we knew the design was working for us, we had to somewhat calibrate it. We had to know its defect. Uh, there is no perfect drifter in the world. There is always uh, some physical nature of the drifter that will make it move slightly differently than the water mass. So we have to know that so we can correct it. So we spent six months doing that. And then we had to uh, receive all the parts and prepare all the GPS, all the batteries. We had a, an army of volunteers also helping us soldering all the wires, making sure we have all the supplies, cutting and preparing and, and assembling. So it took us another four months, I think. The final drifter design was low cost, packable, performed well in the open ocean, and to reduce the amount of waste in the ocean, the main parts were biodegradable. We took a lot of effort to make this drifter biodegradable. We cannot launch that many drifters if they are not biodegradable. It's the right way to think uh, for the future of oceanography. 
Brian House is an ocean sciences professor, also at the University of Miami. He describes how the drifters work. This is pretty simple. So these contain a GPS on this board and a communication to the spot satellite system. So every five minutes, it'll update its position to that to the satellite, which will send the data back to our server at the University of Miami. The key to this all, in terms of using these satellite positioning, is instead of just uh, throwing some floating objects out in the ocean that you can track, say, with a plane or something, the fact that you know which particle is which, which drifter is which, is critical to the analysis of the mathematics of trying to figure out the dispersion and, and how an oil spill would respond. As the boats leave the dock and head into the Gulf, Eric Desaro is excited. We hope to be able to map out the currents in an unprecedented amount of detail and also look at how things spread out. One of the issues with oil is, you, you, put, you know, your oil comes up here, here's where your oil spill is, you know, it comes bubbling up to the surface, so. and then it spreads out. Well, we not only care about where it goes, but how it spreads out. And so having a thousand things and letting them spread out is a lot of the physics that we're after. So this is a really unprecedented opportunity, and we're looking forward to doing it. This concludes part two of our special series. We continue next week, when we'll learn what it's like to be doing research in the middle of the sea, in tight quarters, and on 10-foot waves. Today, thousands of scientists, oceanographers, chemists, engineers, biologists, are all working together to develop newer and better ways to understand and ease the impact of oil spills. To learn more about their work, visit our webpage at dispatchesfromthegulf.com. Funding for this podcast was provided by a grant by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.